Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. If there was a one-stop shop resource for Advent and Lent, wouldn't you want to know? Well, there is. It's the Center for Biblical Studies from Concordia University, St. Paul, led by Dr. Reed Lessing. I'm Pastor Matthew Tuman, and I speak from experience, having used these preaching workshops. Offered online and recorded, they have it all. Sermons, slides, liturgical resources, and Bible studies. All for $25. Learn more at one.csp.edu forward slash Center for Biblical Studies. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. Eyes full of adultery, you know what he means. When eyes look upon another person as a sexual object and imagine how you might gratify your lust on said object and so totally miss the very real and concrete person who is there before you, not for you to use, but to welcome, to love, and to cherish. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of 2 Peter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. As we plowed on into chapter 2 of 2 Peter in our last study, St. Peter sounded the warning against falsifiers of God's word he pointed out that they'd always accompanied the history of the preaching of God's word, and they would still do so till the end of days. The particular folks he had in mind had brought in destructive heresies that overturned the foundation of faith by denying the very Lord who had bought them with his blood, probably referring to Christological heresies. Their false doctrine was mirrored by their loose living as they chased sensuality and greed exploiting God's people with false words. Peter warns their condemnation from long ago is not idle. God guards his flock. He points to three examples from the past. The judgment on the fallen angels, the destruction of the ancient world with the rescue of Noah, and the overthrow of Sodom with the rescue of Lot. His conclusion was that our Almighty God knows how to rescue his own from every trial and how to keep the ungodly under punishment until the day of the great judgment. And this last aimed particularly at those who engaged in lustful, defiling passion and despised authority. A reading from 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning in the middle of the 10th verse. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord, but these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage of their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. 2 Peter 2, verses 10b through 16. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them 
read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort from your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to work your way through today's passage? Let's dig into it. Verse 10. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. So, exactly who are these glorious ones that the false teachers have no hesitation about blaspheming? Ecumenius opined in the 5th century, what Peter is saying here is that the evil spirits are quite prepared to curse the angels as much as they can, but these curses are not returned in kind. Rather, the angels reserve any judgment against them to the Lord even though they are more powerful than any demon. An interesting take, but it sure sounds as though Peter is talking about the false teachers, not demons. 16th century reformer Martin Luther read it another way, perhaps in light of Psalm 82. He calls kings, princes, lords, and all worldly government, not the popes and bishops, authority. For the latter were not to be lords, since Christ appointed only servants in the New Testament. One Christian was to serve and honor the other Christian. Therefore, Peter means that they should be subject and obedient to the secular overlords, in order that the sword, which is instituted by God's arrangement, might be feared. But they do the very opposite. They have excluded themselves and say that they are not subject to the secular government. The New Testament dares to call the authorities God's servants, Romans 13, 4, and urges all submission to them that does not involve you in sinning against God's express commands. I think Luther's read is quite plausible, given the bit in the middle of verse 10 about the way that these false teachers despise authority. The parallel passage in Jude reads, Jude 1, 8, Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. The contrast with this is the holy angels. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. Even though all human sin is certainly an affront to God's holy angels, yet their response to our sin is, is not at all to pronounce a curse upon us and render a blasphemous judgment as though they were the judge to whom all must give an account. They know that they are not, and they know who is. They leave the judgment to him to whom it belongs, and they simply get on with their task of serving the saints. Still, by way of contrast, Peter says, verse 12, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, verse 13, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. Now the psalmist had declared in Psalm 49, verse 12, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. These false teachers have renounced the gift of wisdom and rationality with which God had endowed them, and they are living, as a result, without reflection, like animals of prey. As Ecumenius put it, these men are compared to animals because they live only by their bodily instincts and not with their mind or rational soul. For this reason, they are easily ensnared by corruption and are so far gone in depravity that they do not even know when they are being cursed. They are snared and held captive by their sensual appetites. The venerable Bede described what Peter is driving at here in the 8th century. Just as it is natural for dumb animals to be led into a trap in their search for food, so the heretics, like such animals, have spurned the holy and pure doctrine of the whole church in order to satisfy their corrupt appetites. Church history tells us that there were many such groups in apostolic times and he goes on to name several of them. Peter insists that all such false teachers with their corrupt living will suffer wrong as the payback for the wrong that they're willfully engaging in. We get a bit of a clearer picture about the sorts of misbehavior Peter is describing in the next words. Verse 13 continues, They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. 
They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Now, St. Paul famously said, 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. I always want to add, usually, but not always, and certainly not with these folks. They're simply living for pleasure, and so they party hardy in the broad daylight. Peter warns that they feast with you, a reference I take it to the agape feast in the early days of the church, which usually culminated in the Lord's Supper. They thereby defile the entire body of which they are a part. They're blots and blemishes on the body of Christ, and they revel in their deceptions. Far from living in penitence and begging mercy from the Lord for their sins, they are proud of their licentious lifestyle. They're so deceived that they even take it as a sign of their own superior spirituality. Peter goes on, verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Eyes full of adultery. You know what he means. When eyes look upon another person as a sexual object and imagine how you might gratify your lust on said object and so totally miss the very real and concrete person who is there before you, not for you to use, but to welcome, to love, and to cherish. Their eyes announce that they're always on the lookout for fresh meat for their grinder. Do you understand now why our Lord taught us in Luke 11, verse 34? Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. If you can only look upon others with thoughts of how you might use them for your own pleasure, you have inside nothing but great darkness. And Peter sees the contagion spreading. They're insatiable for sin. They never get enough of it. And in doing so, they entice unsteady souls. Their hearts are trained for greed, as in greedy for always more pleasure. They are indeed accursed children because they have forsaken the dignity of living in this world as the true children of God. Verse 15. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Verse 16. But was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. If you remember from Numbers, Balaam was associated both with greed and with enticing the children of Israel to commit sexual sin. The account of Balaam's ass is in Numbers 22. God opened the mouth of that speechless donkey and gave it grace to speak to Balaam in a human voice and thus showed him his grave danger. Still, though Balaam knew he couldn't curse the people of God, he did point out to the king of the Moabites another way to bring God's disfavor upon them, as recounted in Numbers 31, verse 16. Behold, these, on Balaam's advice, caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and so the plague came upon the congregation of the Lord. That is, he instructed the Moabites to tempt the Israelites with an idolatrous festival that led to sexual promiscuity. One more quote from Bede, There is nothing quite like the love of money to tempt the licentious into corrupting the word of God. That is exactly what happened to Balaam. And that's where we're going to call our halt for today. Next up, Peter will continue his diatribe against these false teachers, calling them waterless springs and mists driven by the wind. They talk big, but their boasts are all folly as they yield themselves to the passions of the flesh and entice others to them. They promise freedom, but they're themselves actually slaves to their very own appetites. Peter says that after they've escaped the defilements of the world through coming to know Jesus, they're entangled again in those defilements and overcome so that their last state is worse than the first, alluding to Jesus' words in Luke 11 verse 26. He says it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the commandment delivered to them like a dog returning to its vomit or a washed pig returning to the mire. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. 
Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.